Section 16 of State of the Union Addresses, 1849 to 1856. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Franklin Pierce, December 2nd, 1856, Part 2. I refer you to the report of the Secretary of the Treasury for particular information concerning the financial condition of the government and the various branches of the public service connected with the Treasury Department. During the last fiscal year, the receipts from customs were, for the first time, more than $64 million, and from all sources, $73,918,141, which, with the balance on hand, up to the 1st of July, 1855, made the total resources of the year amount to $92,850,117. The expenditures, including $3 million in execution of the Treaty with Mexico, and excluding sums paid on account of the public debt, amounted to $60,172,401, and including the latter to $72,948,792, the payment on this account having amounted to $12,776,390. On the 4th of March, 1853, the amount of the public debt was $69,129,937. There was a subsequent increase of $2,750,000 for the debt of Texas, making a total of $71,879,937. Of this, the sum of $45,525,319, including premium, has been discharged, reducing the debt to $30 million. $963,909, all which might be paid within a year without embarrassing the public service, but being not yet due and only redeemable at the option of the holder cannot be pressed to payment by the government. On examining the expenditures of the last five years, it will be seen that the average deducting payments on account of the public debt, and ten million paid by a treaty to Mexico, it has been but about forty-eight million dollars. It is believed that, under an economical administration of the government, the average expenditure for the ensuing five years will not exceed that sum, unless extraordinary occasion for its increase should occur. The acts granting bounty lands will soon have been executed, while the extension of our frontier settlements will cause a continued demand for lands and augmented receipts, probably from that source. These considerations will justify a reduction of the revenue from customs so as not to exceed forty-eight or fifty million dollars. I think the exigency for such reduction is imperative, and again urge it upon the consideration of Congress. The amount of reduction, as well as the manner of effecting it, are questions of great and general interest, it being essential to industrial enterprise and the public prosperity, as well as the dictate of obvious justice that the burden of taxation be made to rest as equally as possible upon all classes and all sections and interests of the country i have heretofore recommended to your consideration the revision of the revenue laws prepared under the direction of the secretary of the treasury and also legislation upon some special questions affecting the business of that department more especially the enactment of a law to punish the abstraction of official books or papers from the files of the government, and requiring all such books and papers and all other public property to be turned over by the outgoing officer to his successor, of a law requiring dispersing officers 
to deposit all public money in the vaults of the treasury or in other legal depositories where the same are conveniently accessible and a law to extend existing penal provisions to all persons who may become possessed of public money by deposit or otherwise and who shall refuse or neglect on due demand to pay the same into the treasury i invite your attention anew to each of these objects the army during the past year has been so constantly employed against hostile indians in various quarters that it can scarcely be said with propriety of language to have been a peace establishment its duties have been satisfactorily performed and we have reason to expect as a result of the year's operations greater security to the frontier inhabitants than has been hitherto enjoyed extensive combinations among the hostile indians of the territories of washington and oregon at one time threatened the devastation of the newly formed settlements of that remote portion of the country from recent information we are permitted to hope that the energetic and successful operations conducted there will prevent such combinations in future and secure to those territories an opportunity to make steady progress in the development of their agricultural and mineral resources legislation has been recommended by me on previous occasions to cure defects in the existing organization and to increase the efficiency of the army and further observation has but served to confirm me in the views then expressed and to enforce in my mind the conviction that such measures are not only proper but necessary i have in addition to invite the attention of congress to a change of policy in the distribution of troops and to the necessity of providing a more rapid increase of the military armament for details of these and other subjects relating to the army i refer to the report of the secretary of war the condition of the navy is not merely satisfactory but exhibits the most gratifying evidences of increased vigor as it is comparatively small it is more important that it should be as complete as possible in all the elements of strength that it should be efficient in the character of its officers in the zeal and discipline of its men in the reliability of its ordnance, and in the capacity of its ships in all these various qualities the navy has made great progress within the last few years the execution of the law of congress of february twenty eighth eighteen fifty five to promote the efficiency of the navy has been attended by the most advantageous results the law for promoting discipline among the men is found convenient and salutary the system of granting an honorable discharge to faithful seamen on the expiration of their period of their enlistment and permitting them to re-enlist after a leave of absence of a few months without cessation of pay is highly beneficial in its influence the apprentice system recently adopted is evidently destined to incorporate into the service a large number of our countrymen hitherto so difficult to procure several hundred american boys are now on a three years cruise in our national vessels and will return well-trained seamen in the ordnance department there is a decided and gratifying indication of progress creditable to it and to the country the suggestions of the secretary of the navy in regard to further improvement in that branch of the service i commend to your favorable action the new frigates ordered by congress are now afloat and two of them in active service they are superior models of naval architecture and with their formidable battery add largely to public strength and security i concur in the views expressed by the secretary of the department in favor of a still further increase of our naval force the report of the secretary of the interior 
presents facts and views in relation to internal affairs over which the supervision of his department extends of much interest and importance the aggregate sale of the public lands during the last fiscal year amount to nine million two hundred and twenty seven thousand eight hundred and seventy eight acres for which has been received the sum of eight million eight hundred and twenty one thousand four hundred and fourteen dollars during the same period there have been located with military scrip and land warrants and for other purposes thirty million one hundred thousand two hundred and thirty acres thus making a total aggregate of thirty nine million three hundred and twenty eight thousand one hundred and eight acres on the thirtieth of september last surveys have been made of sixteen million eight hundred and seventy three thousand six hundred and ninety nine acres a large portion of which is ready for market the suggestions in this report in regard to the complication and progressive expansion of the business of the different bureaus of the department to the pension system to the colonization of indian tribes and the recommendations in relation to various improvements in the district of columbia are especially commended to your consideration the report of the postmaster general presents fully the condition of that department of the government its expenditures for the last fiscal year were ten million four hundred and seven thousand eight hundred and sixty eight dollars and its gross receipts seven million six hundred and twenty thousand eight hundred and one dollars making an excess of expenditure over receipts of two million seven hundred and eighty seven thousand forty six dollars the deficiency of this department is thus seven hundred and forty four thousand dollars greater than for the year ending june thirtieth eighteen fifty three of this deficiency three hundred and thirty thousand is to be attributed to the additional compensation allowed to postmasters by the act of congress of june twenty second eighteen fifty four the mail facilities in every part of the country have been very much increased in that period and the large addition of railroad service amounting to seven thousand nine hundred and eight miles has added largely to the cost of transportation the inconsiderable augmentation of the income of the post office department under the reduced rates of postage and its increasing expenditures must for the present make it dependent to some extent upon the treasury for support the recommendations of the postmaster general in relation to the abolition of the franking privilege and his views on the establishment of mail steamship lines deserve the consideration of congress i also call the special attention of congress to the statement of the postmaster general respecting the sums now paid for the transportation of mails to the panama railroad company and commend to their early and favorable consideration the suggestions of that officer in relation to new contracts for mail transportation upon that route and also upon the tehontepec and nicaragua routes the united states continue in the enjoyment of amicable relations with all foreign powers when my last annual message was transmitted to congress two subjects of controversy one relating to the enlistment of soldiers in this country for foreign service and the other to central america threatened to disturb the good understanding between the united states and great britain of the progress and termination of the former question you were informed at the time and the other is now in the way of satisfactory adjustment the object of the convention between the united states and great britain of the nineteenth of april eighteen fifty was to secure for the benefit of all nations the neutrality and the common use of any transit way or interoceanic communication across the isthmus of panama which might be opened within the limits of central america the pretensions subsequently asserted by great britain to dominion or control over territories in or near two of the routes those of Nicaragua and Honduras, were deemed by the United States not merely incompatible with the main object of the treaty, but opposed even to its express stipulations. Occasion of controversy on this point has been removed by an additional treaty, which our minister at London has concluded, 
and which will be immediately submitted to the Senate for its consideration. Should the proposed supplemental arrangement be concurred in by all the parties to be affected by it, the objects contemplated by the original convention will have been fully attained. The treaty between the United States and Great Britain of the 5th of June, 1854, which went into effective operation in 1855, put an end to causes of irritation between the two countries by securing to the United States the right of fishery on the coast of the British North American provinces, with advantages equal to those enjoyed by British subjects. Besides the signal benefits of this treaty to a large class of our citizens, engaged in a pursuit connected to no inconsiderable degree with our national prosperity and strength, it has had a favorable effect upon other interests in the provision it made for reciprocal freedom of trade between the United States and the British provinces in America. The exports of domestic articles to those provinces during the last year amounted to more than $22 million, exceeding those of the preceding year by nearly $7 million, and the imports therefrom during the same period amounted to more than $21 million, an increase of $6 million upon those of the previous year. The improved condition of this branch of our commerce is mainly attributable to the above-mentioned treaty provision was made in the first article of that treaty for a commission to designate the mouths of rivers to which the common right of fishery on the coast of the United States and the British provinces was not to extend. This commission has been employed a part of two seasons, but without much progress in accomplishing the object for which it was instituted, in consequence of a serious difference of opinion between the commissioners not only as to the precise point where the rivers terminate, but in many instances as to what constitutes a river. These difficulties, however, may be overcome by resort to the umpirage provided for by the treaty. The efforts perseveringly prosecuted since the commencement of my administration to relieve our trade to the Baltic from the exaction of sound dues by Denmark, have not yet been attended with success. Other governments have also sought to obtain a like relief to their commerce, and Denmark was thus induced to propose an arrangement to all the European powers interested in the subject, and the manner in which her proposition was received, warranting her to believe that a satisfactory arrangement with them could soon be concluded, she made a strong appeal to this government for a temporary suspension of definite action on its part, in consideration of the embarrassment which might result to her European negotiations by an immediate adjustment of the question with the United States. This request has been acceded to upon the condition that the sums collected after the 16th of June last and until the 16th of June next from vessels and cargoes belonging to our merchants are to be considered as paid under protest and subject to future adjustment. There is reason to believe that an arrangement between Denmark and the maritime powers of Europe on the subject will be soon concluded and that the pending negotiation with the United States may then be resumed and terminated in a satisfactory manner. With Spain, no new difficulties have arisen, nor has much progress been made in the adjustment of pending ones. Negotiations entered into for the purpose of relieving our commercial intercourse with the island of Cuba of some of its burdens, and providing for the more speedy settlement of local disputes growing out of that intercourse, have not yet been attended with any results. Soon after the commencement of the late war in Europe, this government submitted to the consideration of all maritime nations two principles for the security of neutral commerce. One, that the neutral flag should cover enemies' goods, except articles contraband of war, and the other, that neutral property on board merchant vessels of belligerents should be exempt from condemnation with the exception of contraband articles. These were not presented as new rules of international law, having been generally claimed by neutrals, though not always admitted by belligerents. One of the parties to the war, 
Russia, as well as several neutral powers, promptly acceded to these propositions, and the two other principal belligerents, Great Britain and France, having consented to observe them for the present occasion, a favorable opportunity seemed to be presented for obtaining a general recognition of them both in Europe and America. But Great Britain and France, in common with most of the states of Europe, while forbearing to reject, did not affirmatively act upon the overtures of the United States. While this question was in this position, the representatives of Russia, France, Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, Sardinia, and Turkey assembled at Paris, took into consideration the subject of maritime rights, and put forth a declaration containing the two principles which this government had submitted nearly two years before to the consideration of maritime powers and adding thereto the following propositions privateering is and remains abolished and blockades in order to be binding must be effective that is to say maintained by a force sufficient really to prevent access to the coast of the enemy and to the declaration thus composed of four points, two of which had already been proposed by the United States, this government has been invited to accede by all the powers represented at Paris, except Great Britain and Turkey. To the last of the two additional propositions, that in relation to blockades, there can certainly be no objection. It is merely the definition of what shall constitute the effectual investment of a blockaded place, a definition for which this government has always contended, claiming indemnity for losses where a practical violation of the rules thus defined has been injurious to our commerce. As to the remaining article of the Declaration of the Conference of Paris, that privateering is and remains abolished, I certainly cannot ascribe to the powers represented in the Conference of Paris any but liberal and philanthropic views. In the attempt to change the unquestionable rule of maritime law in regard to privateering, their proposition was doubtless intended to imply approval of the principle that private property upon the ocean, although it might belong to the citizens of a belligerent state, should be exempted from capture and had that proposition been so framed as to give full effect to the principle, it would have received my ready assent on behalf of the United States. But the measure proposed is inadequate to that purpose. It is true that if adopted, private property upon the ocean would be withdrawn from one mode of plunder, but left exposed meanwhile to another mode, which could be used with increased effectiveness." the aggressive capacity of great naval powers would be thereby augmented while the defensive ability of others would be reduced though the surrender of the means of prosecuting hostilities by employing privateers as proposed by the conference of paris is mutual in terms yet in practical effect it would be the relinquishment of a right of little value to one class of states but of essential importance to another and a far larger class. It ought not to have been anticipated that a measure so inadequate to the accomplishment of the proposed object, and so unequal in its operation, would receive the assent of all maritime powers. Private property would still be left to the depredations of the public armed cruisers. I have expressed a readiness on the part of the government to accede to all the principles contained in the Declaration of the Conference of Paris, provided that the one relating to the abandonment of private hearing can be so amended as to effect the object for which, as is presumed, it was intended, the immunity of private property on the ocean from hostile capture. To effect this object, it is proposed to add to the declaration that privateering is and remains abolished the following amendment, and that the private property of subjects and citizens of a belligerent on the high seas shall be exempt from seizure by the public armed vessels of the other belligerent except it be contraband. This amendment 
has been presented not only to the powers which have asked our assent to the declaration to abolish privateering but to all other maritime states thus far it has not been rejected by any and is favorably entertained by all which have made any communication in reply several of the governments regarding with favor the proposition of the united states have delayed definitive action upon it only for the purpose of consulting with others parties to the conference of paris i have the satisfaction of stating however that the emperor of russia has entirely and explicitly approved of that modification and will cooperate in endeavoring to obtain the assent of other powers and that assurances of a similar purport have been received in relation to the disposition of the emperor of the french the present aspect of this important subject allows us to cherish the hope that a principle so humane in its character so just and equal in its operation so essential to the prosperity of commercial nations and so consonant to the sentiments of this enlightened period of the world will command the approbation of all maritime powers and thus be incorporated into the code of international law my views on the subject are more fully set forth in the reply of the secretary of state a copy of which is herewith transmitted to the communications on the subject made to this government especially to the communication of france the government of the united states has at all times regarded with friendly interest the other states of america formerly like this country european colonies and now independent members of the great family of nations but the unsettled condition of some of them distracted by frequent revolutions and thus incapable of regular and firm internal administration has tended to embarrass occasionally our public intercourse by reason of wrongs which our citizens suffer at their hand and which they are slow to redress unfortunately it is against the republic of mexico with which it is our special desire to maintain a good understanding that such complaints are most numerous and although earnestly urged upon its attention they have not as yet received the consideration which this government had a right to expect while reparation for past injuries has been withheld others have been added the political condition of that country however has been such as to demand forbearance on the part of the united states i shall continue my efforts to procure for the wrongs of our citizens that redress which is indispensable to the continued friendly association of the two republics the peculiar condition of affairs in nicaragua in the early part of the present year rendered it important that this government should have diplomatic relations with that state through its territory had been opened one of the principal thoroughfares across the isthmus connecting north and south america on which a vast amount of property was transported and to which our citizens resorted in great numbers in passing between the atlantic and pacific coasts of the united states the protection of both required that the existing power in that state should be regarded as a responsible government and its minister was accordingly received but he remained here only a short time soon thereafter the political affairs of nicaragua underwent unfavorable change and became involved in much uncertainty and confusion diplomatic representatives from two contending parties have been recently sent to this government but with the imperfect information possessed it was not possible to decide which was the government de facto and awaiting further developments i have refused to receive either questions of the most serious nature are pending between the united states and the republic of new granada the government of that republic undertook a year since to impose tonnage duties on foreign vessels in her ports but the purpose was resisted by this government as being contrary to existing treaty stipulations with the united states and to rights conferred by charter upon the panama railroad company 
and was accordingly refurbished at the time, it being admitted that our vessels were entitled to be exempt from tonnage duty in the free ports of Panama and Aspinwall. But the purpose has been recently revived on the part of New Granada by the enactment of a law to subject vessels visiting her ports to the tonnage duty of 40 cents per ton, and although the law has not been put in force, yet the right to enforce is still asserted and it may at any time be acted on by the government of that republic. The Congress of New Granada has also enacted a law during the last year which levies a tax of more than three dollars on every pound of mail matter transported across the isthmus. The sum thus required to be paid on the mails of the United States would be nearly two million dollars annually, in addition to the large sum payable by contract to the Panama Railroad Company. If the only objection to this exaction were the exorbitancy of its amount, it could not be submitted to by the United States. The imposition of it, however, would obviously contravene our treaty with New Granada and infringe the contract of that republic with the Panama Railroad Company. The law providing for this tax was by its terms to take effect on the 1st of September last, but the local authorities on the Isthmus have been induced to suspend its execution and to await further instructions on the subject from the government of the Republic. I am not yet advised on the determination of that government. If a measure so extraordinary in its character and so clearly contrary to treaty stipulations and the contract rights of the Panama Railroad Company, composed mostly of American citizens, should be persisted in, it will be the duty of the United States to resist its execution. I regret exceedingly that occasion exists to invite your attention to a subject of still graver import in our relations with the Republic of New Granada. On the 15th day of April last, a riotous assemblage of the inhabitants of Panama committed a violent and outrageous attack on the premises of the railroad company and the passengers and other persons in or near the same involving the death of several citizens of the United States, pillage of many others, and the destruction of a large amount of property belonging to the railroad company. I caused full investigation of that event to be made, and the results show satisfactorily that complete responsibility for what occurred attaches to the government of New Granada. I have therefore demanded of that government that the perpetrators of the wrongs in question should be punished, that provision should be made for the families of citizens of the United States who were killed with full indemnity for the property pillaged or destroyed. The present condition of the Isthmus of Panama, insofar as regards the security of persons and property passing over it, requires serious consideration. Recent incidents tend to show that the local authorities cannot be relied on to maintain the public peace of Panama, and there is just ground for apprehension that a portion of the inhabitants are meditating further outrages, without adequate measures for the security and protection of persons or property having been taken either by the state of Panama or by the general government of New Granada. Under the guarantees of treaty, Citizens of the United States have, by the outlay of several million dollars, constructed a railroad across the isthmus, and has become the main route between our Atlantic and Pacific possessions, over which multitudes of our citizens and a vast amount of property are constantly passing, to the security and protection of all, which, and the continuance of the public advantages involved, it is impossible for the government of the United States to be indifferent. I have deemed the danger of the recurrence of scenes of lawless violence in this quarter so imminent as to make it my duty to station a part of our naval force in the harbors of Panama and Aspinwall in order to protect the persons and property of the citizens of the United States in those ports and to ensure to them safe passage across the isthmus and it would, in my judgment, be unwise to withdraw the naval force now in those ports, 
until by the spontaneous action of the republic of new granada or otherwise some adequate arrangement shall have been made for the protection and security of a line of interoceanic communication so important at this time not to the united states only but to all other maritime states both of europe and america meanwhile negotiations have been instituted by means of a special commission to obtain from new granada full indemnity for injuries sustained by our citizens on the isthmus and satisfactory security for the general interests of the united states in addressing to you my last annual message the occasion seems to me an appropriate one to express my congratulations in view of the peace greatness and felicity which the United States now possess and enjoy, to point you to the state of the various departments of the government and all of the great branches of the public service, civil and military, in order to speak of the intelligence and the integrity which pervades the whole, would be to indicate but imperfectly the administrative condition of the country and the beneficial effects of that on the general welfare nor would it suffice to say that the nation is actually at peace at home and abroad that its industrial interests are prosperous that the canvas of its mariners whitens every sea and the plough of its husbandmen is marching steadily onward to the bloodless conquest of the continent that cities and populous states are springing up as if by enchantment from the bosom of or western wilds and that the courageous energy of our people is making of these united states the great republic of the world these results have not been attained without passing through trials and perils by experience of which and thus only nations can harden into manhood our forefathers were trained to the wisdom which conceived and the courage which achieved independence by the circumstances which surrounded them and they were thus made capable of the creation of the republic it devolved on the next generation to consolidate the work of the revolution to deliver the country entirely from the influences of conflicting transatlantic partialities or antipathies which attached to our colonial and revolutionary history, and to organize the practical operation of the constitutional and legal institutions of the Union. To us of this generation remains the not less noble task of maintaining and extending the national power. We have at length reached that stage of our country's career in which the dangers to be encountered and the exertions to be made are the incidents not of weakness but of strength in foreign relations we have to attemper our power to the less happy condition of other republics in america and to place ourselves in the calmness and conscious dignity of right by the side of the greatest and wealthiest of the empires of europe in domestic relations we have to guard against the shock of the discontents the ambitions the interests and the exuberant and therefore sometimes irregular impulses of opinion or of action which are the natural product of the present political elevation the self-reliance and the restless spirit of enterprise of the people of the united states i shall prepare to surrender the executive trust to my successor and retire to private life with sentiments of profound gratitude to the good providence which during the period of my administration has vouchsafed to carry the country through many difficulties domestic and foreign and which enables me to contemplate the spectacle of amicable and respectful relations between ours and all other governments and the establishment of constitutional order and tranquillity throughout the union end of section sixteen end of state of the union addresses by united states presidents eighteen forty nine to eighteen fifty six